Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Art of Baseball Experts. I'm your host, Mark Brooks, and today we have the Elliot Hulse joining us. He is the creator and founder of Hulse Strength, Strength Camp. Uh, he's created the home study courses, the Grow Stronger Method, Advanced Neuromuscular Strength, and he has, what, four, or three or four different YouTube channels that you have, Bob? I've got three that I'm actively uploading to. Okay, and you have hundreds of thousands of subscribers with well over 20 million, probably more than more than 20 million uh, views. Um, and you're doing all this to help as many people as possible become the strongest version of themselves. That's a great message. Um, Ellie, it's an honor to have you on the show, man. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. All right, so what does that mean? What does it mean to be the strongest version of yourself? And if you can also tell us, how does that apply to being a baseball player? Well, the phrase has a lot of meaning to it. It really means becoming self-actualized, really reaching our full potential. That's really what it is. We all have a particular potential that needs to be cultivated and nurtured and brought to life. And the way that happens is by stripping off negative or unresourceful ideas, behaviors, habits, that don't allow us to fully shine you know, and be who we are really meant to be. So when I say become the strongest version of yourself, it's also a very subjective statement because we're also very different. You know? uh, what a strong version of you looks like is very different than a strong version of me, although we're both reaching for our full self-actualization, you see? So one of, the, one of the ideas that's very important is to stop comparing. And I think that's one of the biggest prisons that we get trapped in, is comparing ourselves, looking at others, and wondering why we don't have what they have, or Absolutely. we don't look the way they look, and embracing the genius that is us individually. That's awesome. You know, I think the first time that I heard the term self-actualization uh, was uh, Bruce Lee. Actually, he was one of the first people that I've heard say that. And then um, Abraham Maslow, I think, was the guy that coined the term, right? Yep. Okay. Awesome. So, you know, you actually came out with a video recently. Um, I don't, actually, I don't think it was, this was recently. This was a while back. Uh, but you talked about how to go about beating your genetics, you know, the, the physical, emotional, and uh, mental traits that you were born with, how to go about overcoming those and circumventing, uh, you know, those, those limits and reaching your true, true potential. So how would you go about doing that? Well, the very first thing is to consider what I left off with before, which is not to compare yourself or your results or what's coming up in you to anyone else. Mm -hmm. And again, becoming the strongest version of yourself is a, sub is a subjective thing. And that's beautiful because that means whatever you can create and whatever you can become or will become, Mm -hmm. is very different. It's brand new in nature. It's been, never been done before, ever. Right. And to maximize your genetic gifts, because we all have them. Mm -hmm. The problem is that, you know, we're, we're, we're fish comparing ourselves to birds. And the fish is like try, saying, like, why can't I fly? What's the big deal? Why is this guy flying and I can't fly? Without realizing that, you know what, dude, you're a fish. And in fact... You can do tons of stuff that the bird can't do, and you're a pretty damn good swimmer. So when I say maximize your genetic potential or overcome, because it's really not an overcoming, it's a maximizing okay. your genetic potential, it basically means shut out all distractions, focus in, discover what your talents, your faculties, your gifts are, and then cultivate those so that you could become the best baseball player become the best poet, become the best writer, become the best musician, whatever it is that you, you need to do. You know, if you're a baseball player and you realize, and I'm not that familiar with baseball, but if you realize that your batting average is not that great and you're constantly focusing on the other guy with his batting average and you're wanting to achieve a batting average that's just like his, right. but meanwhile you're neglecting the fact that, dude, you're fast as hell. And you can steal bases like nobody else. Mm -hmm. And they're hitting balls into the outfield and nothing gets by you. Maximize that. Sure, you want a batting average that is average. You want a batting average that's, that's good enough to be a pro or whatever the case may be. But do you realize that you're the fastest person here? Now, get faster. Really exploit that thing that you've been given. Mm -hmm. And that's becoming a strongest version of yourself. And it, it may be imbalanced, but... Like I said earlier, it's never been done before. Mm -hmm. Go with it. 
That's that's a great response because I you know I know some of the guys that I've been training and I I have to admit I'm guilty of this myself. You know we get into these we fall into these pitfalls and we try to pigeonhole ourselves and we when we do compare you know other players and a lot of these expectations come from you know the people that we know our coaches. So there is a lot of pressure uh, that you know some baseball players experience. But that's a that's a great response. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about leadership. Um, you know each baseball especially at the collegiate level, you know, there's going to be some team captains on the team, um, some seniority, but what does it mean to be a true leader? The very first thing that I believe a leader has is his own set of values, and that's mm -hmm. very important. Values are one of these things that we either choose or are handed to us, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, in our culture, what's a value that's handed to us is monetary success. What type of car do you drive, right? Mm -hmm. That's of high value. What kind of uh, clothing do you wear? Is, they, uh, is there a, uh, a name brand on your clothing? What type of phone do you have? Do you have like the cheap flip bullshit phone or do you have an iPhone? So these are the things that are handed to us with regard to values. A leader leads himself first because he rejects values that are not resourceful to his core and looks for and adopts values that will enhance himself that would bring him to a stronger version of himself and he realizes and every genius realizes and I'm calling all of us geniuses mm -hmm. every genius realizes that that which we find resourceful personally will also help manifest a stronger version in someone else so for me for example one of the gifts that I've been giving given and one of my highest values because I know that I can do it well but I see that if other people could cultivate it it would enhance their lives tremendously is courage mm -hmm. you see so that is it's very heavily ingrained in my ideas my paradigm my thoughts my behavior this idea of courage so now that I'm so fully enrolled in that virtue uh, and value I can go and I can share it with other people I've been there. I'm, in, I'm so in love with the idea of courage that I'm wrapping my life around it, maximizing it to the greatest degree within me, and I come from a place where I can see it and support you in it. Mm -hmm. See, and that's the difference between becoming the strongest version of yourself and the second half of that mission, which is to inspire others, right? So mm -hmm. that's the leadership part, is the inspire others. Find out what makes you the strongest version of yourself. Find out what virtues and values you can maximize. What are natural in you, but also what you can cultivate to a degree that you think that you know most people can't. And then you go and see it in other people. You see it in your teammates. You see it in your spouse. You see it wherever there are other individuals that you share this life with. You can see, ah, I see where you could be courageous. I, I could see where you're lacking courage. Let me help you. Let me help you bring that out. And by doing so, you don't need a badge. You don't need a hat. You don't need a scepter to say you are the leader because right. you are naturally leading people. Right. So you're basically leading by example instead of... Right. But right. the only way you can do that is by first becoming the strongest version of yourself. Mm -hmm. right? Obviously, example. Mm -hmm. I'm strong here. Let me support you. Awesome. And so as far as, you know, one of the aspects that I've noticed as far as a good leader uh, on the baseball field while competing, because you are competing every single day, you know, baseball is a grind. You play over 160 games a year uh, when you're at the professional level. Where does mental toughness play? What part does that play in being a leader? Well, it's funny, that term mental toughness, you know, because it's very... Um, It can set you down the wrong path. Okay. Because mental toughness is actually not a toughness at all. Mental toughness is a form of yielding, you see? So you've got to be tough. You've got to be courageous, and I like that word better, to yield to the environment, the circumstances that you're dealt, the cards that you're dealt, the people that you're dealing with. Someone who's mentally tough knows how to take what they're handed and be malleable enough of mind, of character, to move with it instead of fight against it, mm -hmm. right? 
So a lot of times we think mental toughness is a form of beating. Arr, go, 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 go. Harder, harder, harder. More, more, more. Beat, beat, beat. Mm -hmm. But that wears you out, first right. of all. <laughs> right. It doesn't always work. So you end up tired, sick, sad, depressed, frustrated after all of this effort. And it didn't get you anywhere. And when you're proceeding from that polite place, right? It's a very male masculine. state of mind. Right, very right. masculine. It's a very masculine state of mind. There's almost this tendency to ignore, negate, even demonize the other end of that spectrum, which is yielding, softing, feminine. Mm -hmm. You see? So you miss out on the other half of the spectrum that you're offered to become a stronger version of yourself or to navigate this world. Mm -hmm. There's a time for might, there's a time for fighting, and there's a time for yielding. And I think in our culture, the man that wins is strategic about when he yields. Mm -hmm. wow. Does that make sense? Is that resourceful? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that totally makes sense. I, cause I know whenever I played at, you know, at the junior college level, I had a coach that was all about the mental toughness, and he was a very masculine person. And just his style of baseball was, because we played almost every single day, it was just so exhausting. There was no way that I could keep that level of intensity uh, five yep. days a week. You know, it's just, it really is impossible and it, it hindered my performance. But um, yeah, that was great. All right, now let's talk a little bit about uh, the physical aspects. Um, you know, a baseball, like I said, a baseball player is playing every single day. They train all off season to uh, increase their skills. But when it comes to the grind of baseball, when it comes to the mid-season, uh, what I've noticed personally is that my muscles start to break down. And I think this is something that a lot of baseball players experience. You know, they build muscle and then it breaks down during the season. Uh, what, is, um, what would you say is the best way to avoid that muscle breakdown? Well, what I see with a lot of athletes, now, now mind you, I, I don't play baseball, but I have baseball players that train at my gym. Okay. Um, I have swimmers that play that train at my gym, and I have tennis players that play at my gym, uh, train at my gym, and I also have hockey players that train at my gym. And the reason why I bring up those particular sports in the same category as I do baseball is because each one of those sports require a repetitive pattern to be performed. You see, mm -hmm. so if you're playing baseball, I mean, how many times a day are you doing this? Right. Right. It, hundreds, perhaps, yeah, right? Countless. Maybe thousands of over the course of a week. When I've got a tennis player, it's the same thing. How many times is he doing this, right? right. Maybe thousands of times a week. The breakdown comes when we experience pattern overload. The nervous system becomes very efficient at these particular movements. And then the muscular system following that pattern starts to develop in order to maximize that particular movement. So for example, for baseball players, and it's not just the arm because it's, everything you do is a full body movement. Mm -hmm. So if you're throwing a lot, I guarantee you that one hip is going to be higher than the other. Usually the opposite hip is going to be higher because mm -hmm. as you're throwing, boom, what happens? You, you lean forward this way, your, back, your, your left hip will rotate forward and, and hike up. So you've got an entire body that is now constructed around that particular movement. The problem is that you're, as a human being, you're not just that movement. So what you're going to want to do is you might want to be climbing stairs. You might want to be climbing in and out in your bed at night. You want, you want to do other things, but you're, you've become so rigid. You've become so fixed in that pattern because your nervous system and your muscular system have really held on to it, held on mm -hmm. to that pattern, that anything outside of it Mm -hmm. will lead to injury and starts becoming very, very uncomfortable. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right? You become a throwing machine. You're a throwing machine. You're a throwing mm -hmm. machine. And um, what a lot of strength and conditioning coaches that don't understand the body to any great degree do is they take their athlete into the gym and then they continue to train those muscles Right. that they've been using out on the field. Like, so they're like, you know, let's do some overhead presses and some bench presses. Like, do you realize that everything that kid does is a press? Do you realize this? And then you're going to put him in the gym and you're going to ask him to do these exercises that further facilitate the faulty recruitment pattern. So what we've got to do as strength and conditioning coaches, but as baseball players, and this is, a, this, in fact, this is a term that I learned from 
some of the baseball players that train at my gym and, and listening to their parents talk is you've got to unwind, right? You're, okay. whi- you're literally winding yourself up. If you're, if you're swinging the bat, you're wound in this position. What you've got to do is you've got to use the correct exercises and stretches to undo the damage, unwind the arm. Very, very important. And if you consider that you're doing a thousand reps a week, right? Mm-hmm. A thousand times, you'll also appreciate the fact that you're going to sp- need to spend a sh- crap load of time unwinding it. If it's mm-hmm. a thousand reps here, then think that it needs to be, at least with regard to time under tension, mm-hmm. a thousand reps this way. Okay. okay. Unwind the body. And that way the joint re- maintains its integrity also. So, so what are some practical ways to unwind? Are we talking about like maybe yoga, uh, meditation, uh, maybe some other, other sport that we could partake in? Well, the most practical form of unwinding is to assess your body, have an assessment done you know, by, by a knowledgeable strength and conditioning coach um, or, or physical trainer or just someone who understands the body to figure out what muscles, right? Because, you know, we've got a, we have a certain number of muscles in our body. Which ones are tight, right? Because if you overuse a muscle, it becomes tight. If the nervous system is constantly recruiting that muscle, it becomes tight. It becomes what's called tonic. Okay. What muscles are tight? And you've got to be completely subjective about this, right? Because there are people that say, oh, well, all baseball players need to stretch this, right? Or all athletes need to do yoga. Or all people need, again, it comes back to becoming the strongest version of you. Mm-hmm. Wait a second. Now, yoga worked well for that guy, right? Stretching your hamstrings worked well for that guy. Like, it, I'm going to date myself here now, but, but back when Ken Griffey Jr. used to play baseball and he used <laughs> to tear, fuck up his hamstring all the time, um, the last thing that did, dude needed to do is ever stretch his hamstrings. I mean, if you just notice the anterior pelvic tilt that was going on, I mean, his butt was hiked up high in the air, his hamstrings were super long. The reason why he kept pulling his hamstrings is because somebody was not telling him, dude, you need to tighten your hamstrings up a little bit. They're, they're way too long. But mm-hmm. you know what he's probably doing every day in practice? Stretching the hamstrings. It's like, right. that's why you keep tearing your hamstring, bro, because you're stretching it. So a hamstring stretch is good. But it's not for everyone. And this is why my I- advice is not popular because everybody wants like that, you know, that cookie cut. Like here it is. Mm-hmm. Boom, boom, boom. Do it. What I'm saying is you've got to – if you're an athlete and you're dedicated to this thing, and this is my appeal to, to everyone that's listening. If you're dedicated to this thing for the long run, learn about your body. Buy, a, buy a anatomy and physiology book because no one's going to care for your body as well as you do, even when they're paying you millions of dollars, Mm -hmm. the physical therapist who's there, really you're just a commodity, you know, it's, what can we do to get this guy back on the field? Not how can we extend his longevity, how could we make him stronger all around, you know, bottom line is they're paying you a certain amount of money, they need you to go play. So he doesn't even care. The doctor, the the orthopedic surgeon, which baseball players seem to love so much, Mm -hmm. does not care about you. He's happy to do the surgery because you just paid for his Mercedes Benz, right? (laughs) Right. The only one that's going to care about you is you. And the only one that's going to get to know you is you. So study this stuff, you know, and then discover what muscles need to be stretched and what muscles need to be strengthened. You know, and again, it's not a popular answer, but that's the right answer. Right. Awesome. All right. So my last question, this is actually a two-part question. Um... And this actually is um, based on the article that you, you had written recently about uh, the Spartans and uh, uh, the value of courage. You talked a little bit about courage uh, previous. Um, why, why is it so important to have courage as a tradition in society? And what do you think is missing? I know that you talked about in a recent interview about there's a lack of tradition when it comes to courage. Um, do you see that still? Oh, well, yeah. It, it's not cultivated in our culture because... Again, I mean, going back to the metaphor as of a baseball player being a commodity mm-hmm. for the baseball team, each and, one, each and every one of us are a commodity. You know, like it or not, and I might sound a bit crazy, but we're all a tax-paying commodity in this economic system, right? So the system, right, that we're, that we're a part of needs us to follow directions. It needs us to be very good at sitting down, listening, following directions, getting a good job so that we can become very good taxpayers mm-hmm. so that you know, the government can do whatever it does with its money, you know, which it's a different story. 
So the point is that we, our nervous systems, in the same way that your muscles have created a pattern overload and there's a, there's a faulty recruitment pattern that's causing damage in your body because you've been doing this thing for so long, it also happens in our mind. It also happens in our character. We've been told to sit down, shut up, follow directions, get in line, do what you're told for so long that it, it's a faulty recruitment pattern. And mm -hmm. I'm calling it a faulty recruitment pattern because it is faulty. Again, the strongest version of you is far more expansive than the container we've been given. Right? Mm -hmm. So to say sit down, shut up, get in line, follow directions is, a, is an assault on the magnificence on their genius that is you. The reason why courage is so important is because patterns become comfortable, mm -hmm. right? So sit down, shut up, get in line, follow directions is a, it's a prison, but it's a comfortable prison. People want to know that they're, that they're, they're going to get their benefits, right? They want to know that their paycheck's going to come. They want to know that they've got food on the table. They want to know that everything is going to follow the sequential order. Everything's going to fall in line and that you had better fall in line if you want to get your slice of bread too. Mm -hmm. You've got to be courageous enough to break out of that in any way, shape, or form. If it's, if it's your style as a baseball player, think about how many baseball players are, are all of a sudden glorified for this brand new style. Mm-hmm. Well, it's not that that guy was sat around and, and designed this new style of pitching. It's that he decided, you know what, I'm courageous enough not to listen to what the coaches have been telling me for several years. Listen to my body and realize that if I do this thing my way, I'm going to totally blow everybody's mind. And then right. you know what happens? Everybody goes to that guy. You know what they say? He, he's an expert. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he's a genius. What did he do? And they're studying him and they're trying to figure out what he did. You know what he did? He did the opposite of what you're trying to do to figure out what he did. He said, screw everybody, screw everything else. I've discovered that my body works best like this and I'm courageous enough to go do it. And that's why we've got to be courageous because you cannot become the strongest version of yourself if you're not willing to set aside everybody and everything else and then to move into your own power. That's, that's a great piece of advice, man, because yeah, if, you, if you look at it just across the board, some of the most influential and some of the most talented and successful baseball players were orthodox. You know, they didn't, they didn't have, their mechanics weren't politically correct, I guess, so right. to speak. So that's great. Um, and that was my last question, man. That was a great way to end on it. Uh, and just to follow up, uh, you know, I do have a lot, of, a lot of questions, or I get a lot of questions from baseball players, and they're all trying to find ways to grow stronger. Um, and I know that you have the Grow Stronger method and the advanced neuromuscular strength. Do you think that that would be the best fit for some of these baseball players looking to grow stronger? Or do you have some other uh, systems that work better? Well, again, you know, and this is why I'm, I'm a terrible salesman, because I'll tell you straight up if my thing is not the right choice for you. And um, the Grow Stronger method as a blanket program is going to be resourceful for you because you're going to get stronger. Right, okay. And in my opinion, the absolute best exercise for a baseball player is a deadlift. Hands down, baseball players need to develop the mechanics and the, the joint mobility and the, the agility and the strength and the power to deadlift. If you do that as a baseball player, your posture will be strong, your range of motion will be strong, your hips, your core, your arms, your back will be very, very strong and you're going to be a badass baseball player. And in my program, I show you how to deadlift more weight. The interesting thing is with the Grow Stronger method is that it's malleable enough, moldable enough, and doesn't require so much volume that you're super sore and tired and if you spent too much time in the weight room mm -hmm. as opposed to doing your thing, which is play baseball, right? Awesome. Playing baseball is really your thing. So it will support you. Right, but there are 101 different ways to, to make that happen. But if you have, if you took one piece of advice with regard to training, increase your deadlift. Now, the advanced neuromuscular strength course, which is is something I also offer, is an, is just what it is. It, what it says it is. It's an advanced course for getting to know your body, like I described earlier, understanding okay. your biomechanics, understanding your physiology, and then designing stretching and strengthening programs that are corrective in nature so that they, uh, they literally teach you how to unwind yourself like I talked about before. Okay. So it's a bit brainy, it's a bit heady, 
But it's if you're really into this thing and you really want to maximize your potential, it's the stuff that you need to know. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and link all that up down below. Um, we're also going to link up your YouTube channels. Uh, do you have a Facebook fan page that they can reach you at as well? Yeah, just Facebook, Elliot Hulse, E-L-L-I-O-T-T-H-U-L-S-E. Awesome. And if any of these people have questions for you, the best way to get in contact with you is to ask a question on the Facebook fan page or YouTube video response as well, right? Yeah, if you send a question to my YouTube inbox, uh, I, I sit down once a week. No, I sit down. I stand up once a week, <laughs> and I answer video questions. So I'll, I'll read your question right there, and I'll make you a video. And, uh, and then once a week, I try to go into Facebook and answer questions on the wall. The problem is that there are literally thousands of them in there. <laughs> and, and I cannot. It's just humanly impossible to get to all of them. So I apologize first and know that it's not that I don't want to answer your question. But if you keep posting it on either or, eventually I might get to it. And, and it's my pleasure. This is what I do. It's my pleasure to support you and answer your questions for strength. Awesome. Well, Elliot, thank you so much for your time, man. This is probably one of the most interesting interviews that we've had with Art of Baseball Productions. We really appreciate it. Great. My pleasure. All right. Take it easy.